Okay, guys, sorry, welcome back. <laughs> I'll just take a minute for the group to find a new stream. Um, yeah, sorry for that. It just, you know, kind of cut out for a minute there. But we are back, and um, I'm happy to see you guys. So please make your gracious return. I'm very sorry about the little connection issue. Um, those things happen. I'm sure you've had some issues on your end in certain classes. So if anything, um, you know, it gives me a little sense of empathy for the students that have to deal with all their internet connection problems over the course of our COVID experience, but it's okay. So I see 14 of you returning back. Thanks a lot, guys. Quite sorry for the uh, delay, but I'll just hold on for a few minutes. If we're going to have some kind of connection issues, then this would be the day, um, I guess, if, if we had to choose, because we don't have a full set of notes to cover today, just a couple of leftover remaining notes. So we'll make sure to cover all the content that you guys do need. Um, sorry for that. Yeah, I, I had to switch to mobile data and, um, you know, I was on the phone with Spectrum last week after I had a little problem on Thursday, and uh, they just said that there were some intermittent outages in the area. Um, Sometimes in the morning, I don't know, everyone maybe locally is using this for their Zoom calls and office meetings. But anyway, guys, thanks for coming back. Um, did you come back based on my message delivered just now through Titanium? I wonder, because I did send one out um, as soon as the meeting kind of cut out in order to kind of try and bring some of you guys back. So maybe some of you have just been patient enough to wait around on the channel, some of you maybe saw the titanium announcement. I'm just gonna hang in there for a minute because I wanna get a quorum, you know, I wanna see if we can maybe achieve similar numbers to what we had before. I think there were 37 of us present. And um, now for part two of our reconnected lecture, I hope that uh, many of you guys will be able to find your way back. Okay, yeah, sorry guys, so thanks so much. And I see more people are coming back. This is good to see. Just so you guys know, this is a possibility throughout various points of our semester. For the most part, I've had very good luck teaching, you know, hundreds and hundreds of lectures through YouTube Live and sometimes Zoom. And whether it's Zoom or YouTube Live, you know, if there's an internet outage, it's gonna affect me the same. So um, I've had good luck. In a couple of cases, there have been these awkward disconnections. And if that does happen, then just, you know, like we've had today, check on your um, titanium because I can always switch to my mobile data and send out a quick announcement to the class, hey, find the lecture again, wait a minute, or whatever the case may be. So if we ever have an unexpected outage like this, then just know uh, that you can check Titanium and I'll follow up with a quick announcement to the class. And um, in general, I'm not going to abandon the stream. You know, I'm not gonna just cancel class if that happens. So you know for a fact that I will be attempting to reestablish the, the connection throughout the window of class time, okay? So guys, welcome back again, and returning to the discussion that we were having, okay? I see that we've got 30 of us now, so it seems like almost all have found their way back. Thanks, John, and thanks to the others. Again, sorry for that. It's really, I'm at the mercy sometimes of the uh, forces of technology, right? Just like all of us. <clears throat> okay, guys. So let's try this again then. Ready? So I was talking about barriers to critical thinking. We talked about avoidance and anger. What are cliches? Hey there, Tucker. Sorry, you haven't missed anything. I was just telling everybody, let's be patient for a minute, let the others come back. It seems like most all of you have found your way back now. I see a number of 33, which is very good. So thanks guys for your uh, perseverance here this morning. Okay, so the third barrier mentioned on the list here is um, cliches. So cliches, they are these overused common sayings, one-liner phrases <clears throat> that basically seek to shut down further discussion or commentary or debate. So phrases and statements like, uh, it is what it is, to each his own. Um, that's the way the cookie crumbles. Um, that's just how it goes, um, whatever. Um, and all of those kind of phrases. So when those are said, it means to the other party in the discussion, let's just drop this or let's move on, which is fair sometimes, but I find that, and the book kind of mentions this, that people do this too often and always want to escape from any kind of intellectual discussion or exchange. So let's not overuse the cliches. Okay, and then so from there, uh, there was ignorance. So this is still just a review of some discussion we had last time. Um, 
Ignorance is when you deliberately stay uninformed about some things so that you don't have to take a choice or take an action. So like choosing on purpose not to become aware of a set of facts so that you don't have to weigh in, take a position, or evaluate the case. Okay, so then finally now let's continue with the new information that we haven't gone into yet. So the next barrier to critical thinking is uh, denial. So with denial, a person simply uh, denies the truth of alternative ideas without even considering the merit of the claims. So, <clears throat> okay, so another kind of bad mental habit that interferes with our ability to be good critical thinkers is a tendency to deny contrary opinion or information without even investigating it or looking into the claim or the evidence. Um, so, <clears throat> I mean, think of, for example, people that say there's no such thing as global warming and I cannot be convinced otherwise. Even if you were to provide this person with like a mountain of evidence compiled from, you know, the best elite institutions and the most highly skilled professionals doing that kind of work. Um, a person that's in the grip of just denial can't be convinced. And sometimes it's on like large social issues of the day, global warming, politics. Sometimes it's just in your individual life, right? Have you ever met a person who like, uh, I don't know, they're, they're committed to doing something that's bad for them, but they just can't be convinced that it's a bad idea. Like maybe they want to drive and they're too drunk and you say to them, you're clearly too drunk and you shouldn't be driving. And they say, you don't know me. You don't know like what I can handle and what I can't. I've, Clearly, I just deny everything you're saying, but maybe the person should stop for a minute and think about it. Sometimes it's better for you to take stock of a contrary point of view than to uh, double down on it. Tiandra, what it says here is, I'll write it for you, okay? Not to worry, thanks for that. I'll try to write a little bigger and more legibly, but it says this, one simply denies um, <clears throat> contrary views uh, without considering the evidence. Thank you. There you go. Denial. One simply denies contrary views without considering the evidence. It's a stubborn refusal to to budge off of your position, even if there's good and compelling evidence to the contrary. So we should be open-minded people. You know, if you're right in a given case and you have the facts on your side, then that's great. But in many cases, people don't even examine the full set of facts uh, to, to have a reasonable opinion. So make sure that you don't shelter yourself or um, exclude yourself from a variety of different opinions and facts so that you can come to the right conclusion. Don't shut down any line of inquiry uh, prematurely, right? I mean, you're supposed to come to a conclusion after you've evaluated the evidence. Imagine if a person was a juror and they said, hey, this guy's guilty. I can't be convinced otherwise. That would not be the right way to do it. You have to make your decision after a full consideration of the facts and evidence. So people sometimes, you know, they force um, themselves not to do that because they're so wedded to their current position. Okay, that's denial. As we go on, the next term under the heading of barriers to critical thinking is um, conformity. A word that maybe you've heard and probably have some basic familiarity with, um, it's that familiar idea of trying to fit in with the crowd, trying to take on the viewpoint that you think is popular or that is held by the majority. So this is just adopting the view of the majority or what you think is popular. And why would a person do that? In order to fit in and to avoid standing out, to avoid being excluded or isolated. So um, one adopts the popular or majority, so I'll put slash, the popular slash majority view
<clears throat> why would you why would you do that? In order to fit in and avoid standing out. Okay, so conformity. Not to worry, Roxana, we all had some issues with the computer this morning, so you're in good company. I actually had to reconnect the lecture, so anyway, uh, glad that you're here. And um, you're joining us as I'm discussing conformity here. So under the topic of barriers to critical thinking, which kind of closes chapter one of the book, another mentioned item is conformity. So as you see, conformity, a person adopts the popular or the majority position why? In order to fit in and avoid standing out. So the conformist is the person that goes with the popular crowd or takes on the views, um, beliefs, opinions, maybe trends of what they think is in the mainstream or what's popular. Um, there are powerful psychological tendencies that urge us towards conformity. Um, as human beings, we're social animals. Some have called us herd animals. We like to be part of groups. We like to be part of a collective. And... Um, Conformity is the tendency that reveals itself when you're trying to join with groups and fit into them. Um, the problem is, though, sometimes what's popular is not actually correct or right, and sometimes the prevailing wisdom or trend is out of line with the truth. Um, if you had followed the popular cu current trends of thinking in, I don't know, the early part of American history, then you would have been in favor of slavery or in favor of women not having the right to vote. But sometimes the unpopular or minority position shows its value and its it's um, truth over time. So you actually want to evaluate the questions being uh, presented to you openly without just going for the most popular viewpoint. Sometimes what most people believe or what's popular is also fair, reasonable, and justified. But you kind of owe it to yourself to take it on a case-by-case -case basis to evaluate those things. Don't just follow the crowd merely because it's popular. There's a lot of we just talked about cliches, but there are some fine cliche sayings that have to do with conformity. Have you ever heard a parent or someone in a position of responsibility tell you, hey, you know, if all your friends jumped off a bridge, would you do the same thing? Basically, they're, they're cautioning you not to be too much of a conformist because sometimes what everyone wants to do or thinks is cool or something is actually to your disadvantage and even self-destructive. Um, so, yes, think for yourself. Be willing to be an individual. Um, that doesn't mean that you have to always break away and rebel from the crowd, but when you agree with what the crowd thinks or what the majority believes, then let it be because you've actually thought about the issue and come to a conclusion instead of just doing it out of a fear or an aversion to the thought of being excluded or socially alienated. Um, okay, so that's conformity. One time I was driving around in Orange County, and uh, this was like not too long ago, actually, and I took a turn into this street where a bunch of other cars were ahead of me and I just followed the line of cars. But when I went onto the street, I saw these construction workers and there were signs everywhere saying the street is closed, you know, for construction work. But I was already there, so I kind of had to proceed through to get away from, you know, the block that I was on. And a guy in a hard hat walked up to me as I was driving and he looks into my car and he said, hey, what are you doing on the street? You know, don't you see this construction zone? And I pointed ahead of me and I said, I'm sorry, but you know, can you see there's like two cars in front of me? I just followed them. I thought they knew where they were going. And he literally did say that famous line right then. Uh, so if all your friends jumped off a bridge, would you do it too, man? And I was like, all right, you got me. You know, fair enough. I guess I should have thought a little bit more and looked at the environment with my own two eyes. So trivial little example, but just something maybe to reinforce the, the lesson a little bit. Okay, so then we continue a couple more barriers to critical thinking. Um, there's also struggling. Okay, so struggling. Um, <clears throat> this in the textbook is described, it's defined as um, a never ending debate about which position to take or what action to take. So it's kind of like when a person endlessly goes back and forth on what to do or what to believe and then never ever reaches a conclusion in the end. So um, endlessly struggling with what action or view to take and then never reaching a conclusion.
Okay, struggling. You see it defined right there. I'll give a little commentary. Um, sometimes it's hard to make decisions, right? Sometimes it's hard to make up your mind. Um, think about a person who's debating and discussing in their mind, um, should, I, should I propose to this person I'm in a relationship with or not? I mean, there's it's a tough decision. It's a big decision. It's something that, you know, you have to be very serious about and you know it's a lifelong commitment so i want to make sure i'm ready for this but i'm not sure i love the person but then again i don't know like so imagine a person kind of keeps going back and forth on that and then they never ever make a decision so in the end um maybe they miss their opportunity to have made the correct decision in that case or you know in other cases maybe there's a policy position that you're being asked to vote on and it's like proposition 22 and the person says how are you going to vote you say well that's a tough one i've actually I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with my decision on that matter. Um, I think there are fine arguments on both sides and I'm weighing them carefully and I'm trying to come up with my own opinion on this. So get back to me. I'm still thinking. You ask them like a day before the election. Well, what do you think now? I'm still struggling up to the last minute. It's a very hard choice, very balanced set of factors on both sides. So I'm going to have to continue to struggle and think about it. You talk to them a week afterwards, hey, how did you vote? And they say, you know, I, I, I kept struggling, and in the end, I could never make up my mind. So I just never did vote or choose. Um, so you don't want to basically waste all the intellectual effort that it takes to, to debate and consider a point um, and then just never do anything or never come to a conclusion. The whole point of the, um, you know, uh, the determination of what you want to do and the sort of review of all the reasons. The point of all this intellectual effort is to come to a conclusion. So it's sort of like if you don't ever reach a conclusion or take an action, then you never really get to the point of all of the um, debate, dialogue, and internal consideration. So, you know, at some level, struggling within reasonable limits is fair and justified because you can't just especially with a weighty or complex decision, you can't just make it, you know, in a, in a snap uh, split second. But at the same time, if it goes on perpetually and never reaches a terminal point, then it's sort of a barrier to critical thinking. And so sometimes people use the complexity of an issue as an excuse to never take a point of view. But you want to have views, you want to reach conclusions, so struggle, debate, discuss the matter, but at some point in time, you have to come down on one side or the other and reach a conclusion. So that's another one, struggling. Um, and from there, there's a couple of extra terms at the very end, and they're sort of described as um, another subclass of barriers to critical thinking, except they're described as forms of narrow-mindedness. So I don't want to make a big deal about this distinction, but I guess forms of narrow-mindedness could be looked at as like a, a sort of subcategory within the realm of barriers to critical thinking. So these are barriers to critical thinking that are typified by the way the person refuses to think outside of a narrow uh, set of constraints. So forms of narrow-mindedness, you can sort of call it barriers to critical thinking part two. It's still barriers to critical thinking, but a little bit more narrowed into the definition or idea of narrow-mindedness. So forms of narrow-mindedness, which are, again, just like additional barriers to being a good critical thinker. Okay, so um, <clears throat> one of these is absolutism. Okay, absolutism. And what absolutism is, is um, the quality a person has if they cannot stand up to authority figures and they always just blindly assume that they're absolutely correct. So, Okay, so absolutism is the quality that is seen when a person cannot stand up to authority figures of whatever variety 
and always just blindly assumes that they're absolutely correct. So absolutely correct. You lack the ability to even question or second guess statements, viewpoints, or directives that you get from some perceived authority figures. Um, you have to have a healthy dose of skepticism about the things that people say and do, even if they sit in a position of high power or authority. So a good critical thinker doesn't just say that because someone holds authority, they must be correct. They take that as a point in favor of giving the view credibility, but it's always going to be balanced against your own independent consideration of the content of what the person is saying or directing. So we don't want to just be lemmings that blindlessly follow without asking questions or thinking for ourselves. At the same time, we should not take it in the opposite direction and overdo it on that side. I'm not saying that you know authority is always to be defied and you should just be the total rebel. Um, in many and even maybe most cases, authority figures justifiably hold their title or position of authority and they have specialized knowledge because of that. So in many, in ca many cases, after all, you know, it's not unwise to follow the guidance or counsel or just take in the information from a perceived authority figure, but it still has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. You still have to think independently and weigh their claims against whether ever, whatever other evidence you may have. So um, absolutism is a habit that we can fall into, especially if you like the particular authority figure or you're like a fan of this person, then you're even less inclined to, you know, have questions, critical, um, commentary or whatever, but we have to try our best to question those, especially those that are in positions of authority, because otherwise we might end up doing or believing things that are not for good for us simply because they came from, uh, from that kind of source. Okay, so that's absolutism. Next form of narrow-mindedness, egocentrism. This is a concept I think most of us definitely know about, whether we ever took this class or not, but as it's in our book, let's go into it one time. So egocentrism, I'm sure you've heard about. It's just the type of idea where a person thinks they're better than everyone else, so a self-centered way of looking at the world, basically thinking you're the center of everything and smarter and better than others, so you would have low level of respect for the opinions of other people. Okay, so... <clears throat> So egocentrism, centrism meaning at the center, centered in the middle, ego, the self, the sense of self. So placing yourself at the center, being self-centered in your way of thinking. Um, if you think you're the center of everything, then you hold yourself in such high esteem. You have such a high opinion of yourself that you think you're better, smarter, more talented, more capable than other people that you deal with. And so if you're that kind of egotistical type of person, then imagine that you encounter someone with a contrary opinion or point of view. You wouldn't take them seriously. You would say, well, I'm smarter than you, better than you, so you disagree with me, but who cares? I mean, you're obviously wrong. That's not the right way to think or act. Um, even if you are a very smart person, and I'm sure that you are, um, you can always learn something from other people. And in some cases, there's just ideas, facts, information that you can say at a social disadvantage because it's easily detectable by others that you're that kind of person that's just in it for yourself. And it's hard then for others to really feel like they want to engage in a stable, valuable, long-lasting relationship with you. So um, the egocentric type of person doesn't necessarily win friends, allies, and acquaintances as easily as you know they would like to. Um, just making sure that we're all good to go with the uh, meeting. Are we? You guys are still here, right? Like there's no problems with the connection and everything. Making sure, just double checking on that. For a moment, I thought I saw that there was like a slight slowdown, but hit me with the chat so that I'm clear that we're all here. I'm just a little spooked from the earlier loss of connection. Okay, perfect then. Thanks guys, just, just making sure. Oh yeah, so egocentric people, I was telling you that this is not a good way to make friends or 
have deep and rewarding relationships with other people, life is a two way street. And so if other people think, well, they don't think they're on my level, they think they're better than me, then why would they give you their all and be a close and committed friend? So there's a social disadvantage. I think also um, it puts you at a disadvantage because you're susceptible to exploitation. You know, that's something that people don't often think about, Like, uh, but an egotistical person can easily be manipulated. How would you manipulate a person with a big ego? Well, pretty easily. You just have to flatter them and appeal to their ego. Oh, you're so awesome, you're great, I love this guy. <laughs> By the time you're saying that to the egotistical person, they're like, wow, this person's really smart because they recognize that I'm such a smart person. Now they're going to give that individual whatever concessions that they might want from them merely because they have flattered them and appealed to their ego. So you want to have an honest assessment of yourself. You don't want to be so in love with yourself that a person who flatters you can automatically bypass all of your defense mechanisms and get things out of you. Um, also, if you're egotistical, then you don't have an honest assessment of the areas where you could still improve, right? An egocentric person thinks, I'm already perfect, so there's nothing I need to do better. That makes it hard for you to recognize weaknesses, areas where you could improve and become a little bit more solid and um, stable in your own right. So a lot of people, I think, get it wrong. They get it twisted. They think egocentrism is the same thing as just having self-esteem and confidence, but they're really not the same thing. Being confident and having self-esteem is compatible with having a reasonable assessment of where you have weaknesses, limitations, and, and drawbacks that you can still work on. Um, so having an overinflated, irrational estimate of your own abilities, talents, skills in comparison to others is going to set you up for a lot of social disappointment, and I think also it's going to set you up for exploitation in this competitive world that we live in. So try your best to not overdo it with the egocentrism. Yeah. And then we continue to the next. So another form of narrow-mindedness <clears throat> is um, ethnocentrism, okay? <clears throat> so ethnocentrism is a it's a big problem in our world that we've seen a lot of, I, I think, over the past several generations and going back in time, too. Um, this is the unjustified belief in the superiority of a person's race or group or culture. Okay, so let me put it here. Ethnocentrism, unjustified belief in the, in the superiority of a person's race, group, or culture. So in this case, what's at the center is a person's um, ethnic identity or racial identity. So in this case, you really have to think of like white supremacists and people who practice forms of bigotry and racism that exalt their own racial, ethnic, or religious category above others. And this is, uh, as the definition and the text clearly say it's unjustified, meaning that it's not based on any kind of um, reasonable evidence. The idea, for example, that there is a hierarchy of the of the races, such that some people are innately more intelligent or moral or whatever or more talented, this is completely false, and it's not based on anything scientific. What we know about human genetics is that the human genome is is identical in each cell where a human being um, exists, the full human genome with just slight little different differences to account for you know the uh, phenotypical traits that we have, it's virtually the same. And nothing about the part of your genome that codes for your phenotypical traits, I'm talking about your skin color, eye color, hair texture, those kind of things, nothing about that has any bearing at all on your intellectual or moral capacities in life. And that's obvious enough. I mean, a little baby who's born today, answering to any physical description, black, white, brown, Asian, anything, this child that's born today is going to, depending on where they're born, grow up speaking the language, enjoying the customs and traditions of the native culture where they're in. So like 
Um, there's no kind of innate bearing that comes from a person's genealogy that makes them more or less um, American or, uh, or, or indigenous or something like that. It just depends on the environmental circumstances that you find yourself in. And so it's completely false, it's baseless, it's really rooted in unscientific um, racist tropes uh, that we've had for a long time in the world. I mean, if you go back into the era of slavery, some people thought that physiological traits having to do with the shape of one's skull had a bearing on how intelligent they could possibly be. That was called phrenology, and it's based on nothing. It's completely unscientific. So people still hold on to these ideas, I guess, because I think people want to have a sense of um, cultural and ethnic identity bound up with the, the way they look and other people that look like them. I guess having a sense of pride for the achievements of people who you know, um, are within your own racial or religious category is a fair thing, but it shouldn't spill over into literal belief in superiority, like this group as a group is better than other groups are. Um, so we know how much damage and division it can cause in society when people don't believe in equality, the basic idea, the basic premise that all human beings are you know, created equal and have equal opportunities. So if we indulge in ethnocentrism, not only are we going to tear up the fabrics and bonds of society, but as an individual, you're, again, I would mention this, you're going to place yourself at a disadvantage because you'll never, if you are this kind of person, take seriously the value, the contributions, the import of people from different walks of life uh, and from different racial categories. So you'll never be able to experience the full value of life because you'll never get to engage with all the diversity there is out there. Um, and you know, we live in a big diverse world that is increasingly diverse. So I have no idea really what it is that the, the white supremacists and you know, so forth really think or want. If they're holding out hope for some kind of return to a racially homogenous world or society, that is clearly, that ship has sailed. It's never going to be that way. Um, so it's better for people to accept uh, the facts of the world that we live in and to move forward with a sense of optimism and just uh, the spirit of, you know, of pride in, in humanity itself. We're all human beings and the racial and national and religious divisions, um, they don't really speak to our common humanity. So have a sense of pride and value in your individual cultures, religions, and races, but let's try to, um, have a fair-minded consideration of the equality that we all do have. So that's ethnocentrism and some commentary on it, an important point. <clears throat> I think that, you know, with your guys' young generation, it seems like um, there's a lot of progress being made, uh, but we've inherited a, a very divided world, and so we kind of have to continue to emphasize these things as we go through life. Okay, so next is uh, anthropocentrism, and this will be the last uh, well, no, sorry, there's two more after that, so let me just continue. Anthropocentrism. Anthropocentrism, so it's listed in the text and it's described as um, the belief that humanity is at the center of all things, and um, therefore non-human animals, the, the environment and nature don't really matter, or they don't matter as much. So, Okay, well, what I wrote there is basically that uh, anthropocentrism definition that mankind is the center of everything and animals, the environment, and nature do not matter or they don't matter as much as us. Um, now here I would like to say this about the concept of anthropocentrism. First of all, centrism again meaning at the center and anthro refers to man, human beings, like anthropology, the study of um, man. Anyway, um, the belief in anthropocentrism, in my view, it doesn't quite sit on the same par as perhaps egocentrism, ethnocentrism. I don't think it's, in my view, as pernicious 
as those are, just because there can be, I believe, fair-minded rational arguments that when it comes to humans compared to animals, that we really are, you know, superior in many ways to those animals, intellectually, morally, um, technologically. Uh, the thing that we're doing right here, you know, having a lecture across YouTube Live, I mean, it's, it's just an impressive uh, testament to the sophistication of human beings and our form of life. Animals, though, um, have value and importance, and I, I'm an animal lover, and I think that people are sometimes too callous and indifferent to the suffering that we sometimes cause them, the way that we treat them as mere uh, resources for us. In many cases, that's reasonable and fair. So, I mean, I don't want to say that being anthropocentric is in the same level as being like a racist or something like that. So in my view, although it's included in the textbook, it sits on a somewhat lower plane uh, along the scale of how bad or um, harmful one of these forms of narrow-mindedness could be. But in the spirit of the textbook and what it's saying, I do think that there's a, rest, a reasonable point here that if you take it too far and you have absolutely no regard you know, for the environment or animals or nature, and you're like, you know, just burn those things up, eat them, kill them, you know, package them for the sake of man um, and don't think twice. If we go too far in that direction without any feeling of constraint, then as you guys know, we end up doing damage to our ecosystem, uh, which in the end comes back to haunt us and harms our own ability to survive and have a stable future on the planet Earth. So anthropocentrism is tricky. You know, I, there, there are valid reasons to see us clearly as, you know, um, a, a superior form of life when you compare man to the non-human animals that don't even have language, technology, all the rest. But at the same time, we're part of a planet, right? We're, we're citizens in a way of nature. We're not just overlords of it. So we want to do our part to maintain its stability. And that means we have to have a healthy dose of respect and some level of concern for the non-human aspects of, of the world. Um, so I would just say practice a little bit of care and concern for nature, even if fair enough, you wouldn't perhaps place ourselves on a moral or intellectual par with uh, the non-human parts of the world. Okay, so then I just have a few more pieces of info and then we'll finish off these chapter one notes. Um, <clears throat> so last couple of points that I'm gonna mention anyway are, um, so there's rationalization. Okay, rationalization. Uh, it, this is a commonly seen uh, habit that people sometimes have where you do something initially and you're not thinking at all about why. You know, you just do it on impulse. So it's not based on critical thought, deliberation, weighing the pros and cons, as we say. It's just done on the moment, in the impulse, in the heat of the moment. But then later on, maybe someone asks you, why did you do that? And now, you, you try to give a more reasonable sounding explanation so that it sounds like you were doing it on a rational basis. But really that's just an ex post facto, you know, after the fact justification of your original action. So here I'll write it in a way that hopefully is clear. Um, So one later creates a rational sounding explanation for the action. Okay, so like, um, suppose that a person, and sometimes you rationalize your action to other people, and sometimes you just do it to yourself to kind of cover up for the lack of critical thought that you had earlier or initially. Like, say that a person picks a major, and they did it in the moment just because they're like, this is easy. This is the easiest major. Like, I'm just going to do a major in, I don't know, um, making up something because I don't want to offend anybody, but this majoring is, this major is all about um, 
drawing triangles or something, you know? So it's, it's like the easiest thing. And uh, the person's parents or something asked them later, why is triangle drawing, you know, your, your, ma your major in college? And you, now you're like, you don't want to just say to your parents, oh, well, this is so easy. And that's what it just seemed like would be the easiest thing. I don't like to do work. So maybe you'll be like, oh, what's well, a growing field? You know, actually, it's, it's something that a lot of people are going into. And so I thought it would be smart, you know, maximize my options for after graduation. That's a rationalization, maybe. It's a weird example. Let me give another one. Um, someone breaks up with their partner just without thinking. Like, all of a sudden, they just get a spur-of-the-moment feeling, and they just do it. Later on, they're talking to their friends, and their friends are like, why'd you do that, though? I thought they were really cool. And now they're saying, well, okay, if I really think about it, now they're trying to come up with a reason. They're like, oh, uh, well, you know, I was never exactly happy based on those couple times that we disagreed over music, and it kind of kept getting to me, and so I had to make a decision. But that wasn't at all on their mind when they did it. So they're giving what's called a rationalization, trying to make rational sounding an action that was not done on a rational basis. Sometimes we do impulse purchases, right? You buy something um, without having really considered whether it's a good idea for your budget or whether you really need the thing. You just want it, and so you get it right then and there. Um, one time in my life, I bought these big Timberland boots, you know, because I've always kind of just wanted a pair. I like the rugged, urban look of the Tims. And... Uh, but I didn't really need them, you know. At the same time, I bought them, and then I had friends here in California that were like, why you got these Timberland boots? Like, it's not that cold out here. And so I was like, well, uh, I wasn't going to just say I was walking around the mall, and I saw them, and I just finally bought them. So I said, well, you know, actually, I have a trip um, to the East Coast that's planned in a few months, which was true, but I hadn't been thinking of it at the time. And I was like, uh, yeah, because when you're out there and there's ice on the road sometimes, you know, there's ice snow falling uh, you don't want to slip and fall they got those nice thick treads so isn't that a great reason to buy the Tims? i'm going on a trip to the east coast and you know if i was wearing adidas or something i'd probably be slipping all over that sounds like a good solid reason but at the moment i was just doing something on impulse anyway i'm giving you random different examples of rationalization sometimes it's not you justifying your action to another person in other cases you're trying to make yourself feel like more reasonable like so you know you do something on the spur of the moment and then later on, to make yourself feel like you're smart and composed, you, you invent a reason that you didn't have at the point of action. Um, I'll give you one more, just because I can keep thinking of the cases. Somebody wakes up on the day of the election, and they like look at, you know, they open their eyes, and they're like, I'm going back to bed. I'm just tired. I don't want to get out of bed. This is like just too much work. So they don't go to vote. Why? Just because in the moment, on the day of, they felt lazy. Later on, they have friends asking them, what's up with the election? How'd you vote? And they say, I didn't vote. They say, well, why not? Now you're like becoming the, the political theorist. You're like, oh, well, you know what? Because um, I just don't think that voting changes anything. You know, I mean, does it really, it's one person's vote, but the system is all kind of corrupt. I really don't think anything changes in, in politics. So what would be the point of voting? Now it sounds like they have this kind of political manifesto, like it's a principled decision not to vote. But it was really just done on the, you know, impulse, and now they're trying to give you an explanation that sounds more detailed. So anyway, back to this, we should not always have to rationalize to cover up having done things without any kind of intellectual basis. We should think of the reasons in advance and not have them come along for the ride later on afterwards when we're trying to make it seem better. So deliberate and consider your actions in the advance of doing them. Do things on a basis that you actually weighed the pros and cons and you're doing it out of principle, not just um, with no principle, with no logical underpinning, and then later on you have to somehow spin your wheels to make it sound like it was done on a thorough, reasonable basis. Okay, so that's rationalization, guys, with some different examples. Um, and I just have two more. Next, we have double thing. <clears throat> Double think is a uh, originally a term from the novel 1984 by George Orwell. Probably some of you had to read that in high school. I know I did, but if you haven't, it's an interesting dystopian novel about a kind of totalitarian society ruled by this tyrannical government where the the figurehead of leadership is named Big Brother, and they basically watch everything everybody does, and they control them, and they won't allow people to dissent. Anyway, so in the book, one term that's used by the ruling party uh, in the, 
novel is doublethink. And doublethink has since been a more general term outside of just the one novel to refer to whenever a person has two opposite beliefs at the same time. So that's what it is, double think, thinking two completely opposite things both at once. So when a person believes two opposite things at the same time. So sometimes it's kind of like having double standards in your head and not resolving the contradictions. Like suppose that a person believes, okay, or they say they believe that men and women are equal and they should have all the same rights, privileges, and et cetera in society, none treated better or worse than the other. But then they also believe that when it comes to household labor, the woman should be doing most of the chores at home because that's just a woman's job. So these two beliefs don't seem to go well together. Number one, that men and women are equal and should be treated equally. Number two, that women have some duty to take on more of you know, household chores. Um, so these two beliefs are kind of opposites, but in some cases you see a person claiming to believe both. That's a contradiction. And so if you have double think, you kind of have to resolve these contradictions one way or the other and decide which of the two beliefs do you really favor because they can't both be held at the same time or at least if they are, then you're contradicting yourself and not making sense. Like what if a person says that, um, I believe same-sex couples should be able to get married and there's no problem with that. At the same time though, if my, if my own son or daughter was to do it, I would be opposed to this. That's another contradiction. So which one is it? That it should be respected and condoned or that it should be condemned if it's something that's hitting a little close to home. Um, once again, a person might hold that these two beliefs are both in their mind at the same time, but that's again a case of double think. So it's sometimes hard for us to grapple with the contradictions and tensions that lie in our own belief system, but you have to do that, otherwise you end up not really making sense to other people or even to yourself. So double think is a way of living in a contradiction, um, believing one thing, but also believing the opposite of that same thing. Let me see if I can mention anything from the book that adds a little bit more detail to that. <clears throat> It says here, people who engage in rationalization often get caught up in double think. Double think involves holding two contradictory views at the same time and believing both to be true, sometimes called double standards. This is particularly prevalent in response to highly charged issues. For example, when most college students state what they believe uh, that they believe in the equality of men and women, however, when it comes to lifestyle and careers, many of the same students who claim to believe in equality and freedom of choice also say that women should be the primary caretakers of children. Um, and then they mentioned teachers. Some teachers who will say that they believe men and women, ma male and female students should be treated the same, will still call boys more often in class and have more tolerance of the disruptive behavior of boys as compared with girls, and some studies have shown that. And they mention also the majority of white Americans champion equality as a principle when it comes to race, but in some cases may harbor prejudices. So double think can have an impact on real life decisions, According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, women, including those who work full-time outside the home, still perform the great majority of housework and child care. So they just go into some of that uh, sociological data about the current status quo. Okay, double think. And then uh, last form of kindness, and that'll, that'll just close out all the notes that you want for chapter one. There's also um, cognitive and social dissonance. So what is this? Cognitive or social dissonance? Um, so these are situations where your um, ideas or social behaviors come into conflict with new um, ideas and new social norms. So when one's, sorry.
Okay, so cognitive or social dissonance. The word dissonance is like a uh, term coming from music. Um, it's the opposite of, of harmony in music. So dissonance is like two tones that don't work well together that produce a kind of cacophonous or a literally just dissonant um, pair of notes. Like if you play a note and a seventh, or like a half step above that one note, it's going to sound eh, like really awkward and weird. So that's dissonance musically, when the two notes don't go together, basically. And so as a metaphor, we can say that with cognitive dissonance, two ideas don't go well together, your established idea and then a new idea that's coming uh, forward in society. And social dissonance is very similar, but it's just established social behaviors, patterns of social behavior that you've taken to become normal are now coming into conflict with new normal social behaviors that are emerging in society. So think of this in line with examples of like members of older generations. Have you ever experienced the case of like, I don't know, one of your grandparents commenting that the world is so different now from how it was when I was a kid. I mean, I can't believe how much different you kids are now with the music, with the blah, 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 technology. You know, so members of those older generations, they're seeing this new normal replacing their old normal. And that conflict that happens in the tension between the old and the new normal is this kind of social or cognitive dissonance. So the way people took it to be normal behavior as like an average college student back in the 50s or something is much different than what we consider normal today. So sometimes that produces a feeling of social dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is kind of the same, just on a more individual level. You have beliefs, ideas, attitudes that now come into conflict with new beliefs, ideas, or attitudes that you yourself are becoming exposed to in, in the world. So when we have these feelings of dissonance between the old and the new, we sometimes have to make space for the new in order to resolve the tensions. Um, now, I would just say this, like, the only time where I guess it would be not so good to move into the new normal is if the new normal was going in a bad direction, right? So, like, imagine that you were a citizen of Germany before the Nazi era, and then you see Nazism starting to spread throughout society, that would be kind of like a very weird case of social dissonance because you'd be like, well, our old normal was much more egalitarian and fair, and the new normal is getting really racist and, uh, and, and dangerous. Um, then I feel like you probably would want to resist the change to the new normal. So it depends kind of whether or not we're looking at a period of history where there's progress or social decline. Um, but at any rate, given charitable assumptions that most of us have, that the general arc of human history is in the direction of progress. I mean, after all, we have abolished slavery and women can vote now, and there's a lot of more equality, I guess, if you measure it along certain um, kind of metrics as those, then, then we should in many cases be willing to expand our belief systems, modes of thought, and um, social norms to accommodate the new. Um, Sometimes when you're forced to live in new places with people that hold different uh, lifestyles, that can also make the uh, ex experience of cognitive or social dissonance more apparent to you. Like if you're all of a sudden transported to a completely foreign culture, way of acting is considered rude or offensive or something, then you might also experience this. If you've traveled sometimes, then that might be another way of getting a window into this, if not just through everyday life in our society. Okay, guys, so what we've done today, we had a key meeting. We finished off all the notes from chapter one, and so everything all the way up till here, going back to the beginning of the class, those are topics that I could mention or include on the first quiz. Um, I want you guys to remember some important points. I want you to know what is um, deductive validity. I want you to know what is soundness. I want you to be able to provide an example of an argument that is either deductively valid and not sound, or which is deductively valid and sound. So just keep that in mind. I'd like you to know what the concept of an inductively strong argument is, and I'd like you to be able to give an example if I asked you for one. I'd like you to be able to know what are the different types of sentences that we mentioned, whether it's assertoric, interrogative, imperative. I'd like you to know how to present arguments in standard form. So when you're writing arguments out, if, if you're prompted to do that on the quiz, make sure that they're given in the right standard form, whether there's conclusion at the bottom and the premises listed above. 
I also need you guys to know um, what is the definition of uh, these different types of deductively valid forms of arguments. So disjunctive syllogism, modus ponens, modus tollens, chain argument. You should be able to generate an example of those, or you should be able to recognize an example and then give the name, which is the correct name. Um, so just keeping in mind all those points from the early meetings, those are things that could be part of the questions in the quiz. Um, I then want you guys to also remember the stuff that we've talked about now in chapter one. So just have a sense of what are the Milgram study, the Zimbardo study, um, what importance they had, what they showed us in the end. Um, know the stages of cognitive development, the qualities of a good critical thinker, what some of the benefits are, and what the barriers are that we've just now finished talking about. Uh, so here's some questions I see in the chat. The quiz is not on Proctoria, no. The quiz is just, you're just gonna get the blank quiz form with the questions on Thursday morning, and then you're just gonna respond by sending me your document with completed answers to my email address as an attachment. So, I don't know what is Proctorio. I assume it's probably some app that other professors use to, I don't know, inhibit plagiarism or something. But I'm not using any such apps. Just, you're gonna email me your, your quiz, and I won't be proctoring it. Um, how many questions will be on the quiz? It's going to be about 17 or so. And Alicia, thank you for your question too. I mentioned this earlier, but I think maybe we didn't get to catch it. So good to know. It's We do not have a class meeting on Thursday. There's just a quiz itself. I'll distribute it through Titanium and you'll get you know, your copy of the quiz form at 8.30 a.m. And then you just have to send me your answers back in an attached file no later than 9.45 a.m. So you just have to return it before the end of the class period. Yes says, do we include the questions? Well, uh, I thought that probably you would just type your answers into the existing blank document where the questions are already listed. If you don't do that, though, it's okay. I'll, I'll know what the question is if you simply number it. Uh, but most people in the past have just typed their answers into the blank Word file that I'll send you. But it's okay if you want to handwrite or use a different format. The other thing I want to tell you guys is that you're definitely not allowed to create like um, a big answer bank that every student uses in common. I mean, if you're using definitions that come from the book and stuff, that's fair because we're all using the same book. But I don't want, like, for example, every student to say, okay, well, hey, let's all collaborate in a group chat and find out examples of what is a valid but not sound argument, and let's all use the same example. So just don't do that, okay? Like, come up with the examples and stuff of valid, sound, valid, not sound, inductively strong. Come up with those on your own. If you all have examples that are written in the exact same words as others, like everyone says, you know, all men can play sports and Kobe Bryant is a man so he can play sports. And if I saw like 40 of those, that would be annoying, right? I would have to say, well, many of these people are merely taking guidance from another student that created the answer key. So I'm just saying don't collaborate except to talk and compare notes about the concepts, but don't create an answer bank that everybody can use. If you do, I won't give you the credit that you want for that kind of response. But you don't have to worry about that if you're not sharing and collaborating on answers. You'll get your credit, no problem. Okay, other questions about this at all? So, I mean, I'm not proctoring you, I'm not watching you, and I'm just giving you that as your guidance. That's the way that I know that you're not going to share answers and stuff on your quiz. Um, but any other questions? We only have a minute here, so I guess we're running low on time. If you don't have more, yeah, you can. I mean, there's no way I'll be able to determine what you are doing. So you can use your textbook, your notes, your memory, and any other combination of those things. But what you can't do is be talking to other students like, hey, what are you going to write on this question? And again, if I see people with the same exact answers um, as examples, then that's going to be noted and they will get a little deduction of credit. Okay, but yeah, you can use your textbook and all your notes. Um, you're at home. There's no camera on you. So, I mean, you're going to use everything you've got to, to answer the questions correctly. Okay, anything else guys, I guess for now, if not, we can uh, adjourn, but I'll be available through email over the next couple days, um, and I'll be in touch with you on Thursday morning, so I'll also make sure to follow up with a quick detailed reminder about the upcoming quiz tomorrow night, and that way you'll have all your directions and instructions clear for the day of Thursday. So, all right guys, have a good one. Thanks again so much for all of your um, participation. I'm sorry for the little slight outage that happened this morning. To those that have tuned in a little later, 
just know that there was like 10 minutes of the meeting uh, in a previous stream and they'll both appear on the channel after it uploads, which sometimes takes like 12 hours or so. Okay, then, well, I'll see you next time. Have a good day and um, take it easy. Bye-bye. <clears throat>